Good morning, uh, Lord, Lord Foster. Um, oh, Graham, uh, although, Don, forgive me, I refer to you as Don throughout. <laughs> uh, welcome uh, to this, uh, this discussion ahead of our rural conference next week under the theme of revitalising rural. Uh, obviously, uh, we were extremely um, pleased with the uh, report that came from your uh, select committee in the House of Lords on the rural economy. Uh, and uh, as you know, we are seeking to take that work um, forward ourselves. So a really big thank you both personally and on behalf of the RSN Don for giving up your time this morning. Um, let, me, let me start with the first question. Uh, it's clear from the government's response to your committee's report that the government does not support a rural strategy, um, saying that it would uh, refresh its vision set aside the fact of uh, neither you nor I being able to find the vision it's going to, to refresh. But have you actually seen any signs of progress at all or a timetable uh, on this? Because uh, we haven't. And this is a, an undertaking from what, July last year? Um, well, I mean, I'm as bitterly disappointed as you about the um, lack of any apparent action by the government on any of the key recommendations in our report. But can I just begin by saying it's actually great to be with you and it's great that you are uh, in the Rural Services Network continuing uh, the battle to try and achieve by whatever name uh, a strategy for our rural economies. And the, the reason why that's so important is because you, your members, I, members of my committee and many others know that successive governments, not a party political issue, successive governments have totally undervalued the contribution that uh, rural areas can make to the overall economy of the country. And despite that, there are some quite amazing things going on in various rural areas around England. Uh, but sadly, that's not because of, but it's almost in spite of, uh, government action, which so often has been the development of policies that are designed primarily for urban uh, and suburban areas and certainly don't seem to take into account uh, the needs of rural areas. So congratulations to what you're doing. But like you, I am bitterly disappointed that we got such a poor response uh, to the report and notwithstanding the current crisis that we're all going through in urban and rural areas with coronavirus yeah. um, and you know that gives some excuse to the government for not getting on with things but you know frankly uh, if they'd start addressing these issues they could help with the uh, problem that we're going to have post the uh, pandemic where we are going to need every part of the economy to be uh, working flat out and the rural economies are not going to do that unless government begins to see the need to provide the appropriate support uh, that's needed. Absolutely, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, one of the areas where the government uh, did sound more positive was on the area of, uh, of rural proofing. Um, have you actually seen any anything at all in the last 12 months or so. I, 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 I could tell, tell where your question was going. I mean, <laughs> the answer is categorically not. In fact, we've seen exactly the opposite. Now, there's no question in my mind whatsoever uh, that the Minister in the House of Lords uh, is as keen as you and I to see some things happen. But sadly, uh, he is a, a fairly lone voice He's a junior minister. One of the recommendations in our report was that the person with responsibility for rural issues should be given a much higher status within government so that he or she uh, could be listened to. But sadly, uh, it is a, a lone and very small voice that's not being listened to. You've only got to look at measures the government uh, introduced um, proposals some months ago now in relation to... Uh, for instance, uh, people doing apprenticeship schemes where they suddenly announced they were going to offer uh, all sorts of uh, free transport vouchers. But of course, you know, in rural areas, I mean, there's not much point in having a free transport voucher if there isn't any 
of public transport on which to use it. Uh, and, and I know that, that your members and other rural organisations have been deeply concerned about the latest proposals in terms of house building um, that have been proposed by Robert Jenerick. I mean, you know, we, in our report, we were arguing that the criteria where local authorities couldn't demand uh, affordable social housing uh, to be included in developments uh, under 10 properties, we said that that should not apply in rural areas because the vast majority of developments in rural areas are going to be uh, small scale. Uh, and yet we do desperately need more affordable housing in rural areas. And instead, what we've had is not uh, a dropping of the uh, 10 limit in relation to rural areas, but now they're talking about no requirement for uh, developments 40 or 50, uh, which of course is, is wholly the opposite of what is needed to support rural areas. I mean, we were very clear that, uh, you know, if you're going to support rural areas, you have to look at all of the things that are going to be needed uh, in rural areas, and that's going to be affordable housing and affordable workspaces, but it, it's also those, those other things, you know, decent broadband, decent mobile coverage, access to finance, access to business support, skills and training, and so on. You, we all know the list, and a fair share of the funding for things like, you know, public transport, for policing, uh, and, and, you know, the other services from local authorities. And so while we know that some of those are being looked at, the Fair Funding Review, making some progress, but very slowly, uh, and may help, the vast majority of these areas are ones that government are not looking at. And so, you know, yes, they say that they're going to look at rural proofing, but the answer to your question is very simply, sadly, we've seen very little evidence that they are doing so. The one good thing I would say is that when I last spoke to the minister, he assured me that a report is in uh, the process of preparation where they are talking to each individual department about what they're doing in relation to rural proofing as the first step of their supposed rebooting of rural proofing. So let's wait and see what that report says. But evidence on the ground um, suggests that very little has happened. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also understand that the, uh, the report is in preparation. Uh, we've been told that in our, uh, what have been the weekly meetings with DEFRA over the course of uh, the pandemic. So uh, let's see where it goes and, um, and, and cast, a, cast a, good, a good eye over what is actually being said in practical, in practical terms. Returning to that, that question of the um, uh, the latest proposals on uh, limits on development and exception sites for affordable housing contributions. It seems to me that it's going to be introduced by way of secondary legislation. What opportunities does that, does that give you or your, and the, your colleagues in the Lords to actually raise these points? Well, there will be the opportunity to do it. Unfortunately, because of the way um, things are now working in Parliament, um, there is a very limited number of people who can speak in any particular debate. Uh, and, and what we also know is that the, uh, the various statutory instruments that they're going to introduce are going to be done at very short notice, and they're almost certainly going to be done on Fridays. And so that, that adds to the complexity. I mean, not, you know, not uh, a daft move by the government to do that, um, you know, because uh, they're obviously hoping that the vast majority of people will stay away. Um, but because there are limits on the, the, the amount of time we can have, the number of people who can speak, that also will make it difficult to raise these issues. But what I can tell you is that certainly my party, the Liberal Democrats, but I understand that there are people in Labour and indeed in the Conservatives and crossbenchers who are concerned about the planning proposals, not just because of this issue of the, uh, the, the lack of uh, requirements in relation to affordable housing, but for many other reasons, probably the biggest one of all being uh, the way in which that local 
councils are really being written out of the equation. Uh, and if we remove that element of local democracy uh, in vital issues like planning, not surprisingly, that's going to raise the hackles of very many people in both houses of parliament. And I hope that that, rather than the specifics of the uh, the 10 limit or the now for, uh, sort of 40 or 50 limit, uh, will be one of the key uh, reasons why there will be opposition to it. Yeah, of course, there are two different processes there, aren't they? Because the, um, the quota thing is in the uh, changes to the current planning system, sure. whereas the, um, the zoning and the, the, the lack of democratic input into the planning process is part of the wider pa white paper, uh, which will need primary legislation. So, sure, yeah. but... but I think, Graham, the point is that what what the two put together, and oh, you're absolutely correct, they're in different things, but the two put together uh, set the mood of where the government is going. And when you've got a sense of where the government is going being uh, one that many of us don't like, then that will have a knock-on effect in, in both those separate debates, but they are actually related because many local councils would certainly not be willing to introduce uh, a 40 or 50 limit. That not the case for all councils, sadly, but uh, for very many. Yes, absolutely indeed. Um, in fact, I was admonished the other day by um, suggesting that those things in the changes to, planning, to, to the planning system, which are described as being temporary, are only temporary. Yeah. I suggested they're only temporary until they became permanent. And it's yeah. you're absolutely but, right. They set the mood. Yeah. And 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 also remember, temporary uh, is far too late. It's only going to happen once where you have a development that doesn't have any affordable housing in it. And that will be the last house building in a small hamlet, small village, small town uh, for many years to come. So even if it's temporary, the lasting implication is, is significant. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, moving on then more generally, um, how can, given the government's response to your committee's report or the lack of positive response, uh, what can you and your colleagues in the Lords actually do to try to keep this whole agenda um, um, alive? Uh, you know that we are very keen to work with you and your colleagues uh, in doing that, but uh, it'd be interesting to hear your your views. Well, I, I, a number of things are already happening. I mean, a number of my colleagues, and for uh, reasons to do with limitation on the number of speakers we're allowed in debates, it's not been me personally, but I've been liaising with colleagues. A number of my committee colleagues have been taking a very active part in the uh, the deliberations of the Agriculture Bill, uh, which are coming to a uh, head over the next uh, few days in Parliament. Next week, there'll be quite a large number of votes uh, on some of the amendments that have been put down, some of which are directly relevant to some of the issues raised in our report. But they've also been an opportunity to raise with ministers some of the wider issues uh, I mean, you, you know, I mean, it is quite surprising uh, that, uh, for instance, we still do not have any details of the Shared Prosperity Fund. Absolutely. Now, uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund um, <laughs> is going to be relevant in a very short period of time. And yet we still have not got details uh, of, of how it's going to work, who's going to benefit from it and indeed who's going to lose out. And many of our recommendations make reference to the Shared Prosperity Fund, just small scale issues where there needs to be funding available to provide help in those rural communities where perhaps there aren't champions who are pushing forward for some of the things where there needs to be some help provided to, to develop that type of activity. And so the Shared Prosperity Fund is just one very good example of the sorts of issues that colleagues have had the opportunity to raise during the passage of the Agriculture Bill. And of course, through various parliamentary questions that I and others have been asking 
uh, as you know, Graham, I've already asked questions about uh, the new uh, threshold for affordable housing that we were just discussing. But I think once we get through the pandemic and once we uh, start getting back to some degree of normality uh, around the country, but equally in Parliament, then that is the time when uh, further consideration needs to be given to the proposals that we put together across party uh, alliance through an all party parliamentary group of one sort, uh, bringing people together to uh, really work on promoting the sort of recommendations uh, that were in our report and which I know you, your members, but many other organisations uh, are keen to push forward. So I think it will be through some sort of grouping, but they're very difficult to establish when so many people are, uh, are operating as we are now on Zoom or Teams or whatever it might be. Thank you, that's, that, 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 that's cert certainly encouraging. Uh, and I reiterate the offer for us to work with you and your your, your colleagues. Yeah. In the event. Well, I, I mean, and just I so it's absolutely clear, I've talked I've talked to all members of the committee uh, about this. I'm in fairly regular contact, although it's much more difficult at the moment, uh, with colleagues. And I know that there is a real desire uh, uh, among those who served on the committee to play a part. And, and it's worth just reminding ourselves that while I was chairing it, and my claim to fame for uh, understanding of rural areas is merely that I live in one of the remotest parts of, uh, of rural Suffolk uh, with my peacocks, and I apologise to the background, um, but th th they weren't mine, they just appeared, but you know how these things are in, in rural areas. Uh, but on the committee, we had some really... Uh, amazing talented members with a great wealth of experience of these issues um, so uh, they I, I, I'm absolutely sure are going to be fully supportive of pressing ahead in, in the best way we can and many of them have already been doing so through the parliamentary questions they asked through their contribution to debates and so on. Wonderful thank you very much indeed now I was just going to say that um, we are in the final stages of, of uh, uh, finishing our revitalizing rural, uh, realizing the vision documentation, which I hope thing, takes things forward from four months ago, that looks at a more recent evidence base. Uh, and as soon as we have that uh, more finalized, I will obviously make sure that you and your colleagues uh, get sight of it. Well, it's not only getting sight of it. I mean, it's, it's making sure you use us because this is oh, a yes. two-way process. Uh, I mean, you know, I and many of my colleagues, not just those who are on the committee who care about these issues, uh, will do all we can if you give us the pointers, give us a bit of the ammunition, and we'll be very happy to fire that. And, you know, one of the things that we can do uh, is to put down parliamentary questions, whether they're written questions where we get answers. Oh, they take 10 days and more, but we eventually get them. And that's something on the record or on the oral questions that we can ask where we actually have ministers um, being directly questioned on the floor of the house. Um, and, and those are things that we can do. There are of course limits of, we have to go through balloting process to see if we're successful because all every peer is desperate to ask questions and so on. But within those limitations, there's a real willingness, certainly from me, but I know many of my colleagues cross party to do what we can to help. Fine, and let, let, let me stress that we work with a whole host of rural organizations in our representations. And I'm sure I speak for them in saying that uh, yeah. Individually, well, I, yeah. I mean, to, to be honest, Graham, you're not the only person I talk to about rural issues. Am I? Not? You're quite, you're, yeah. no, I know it's disappointing. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, the Rural Services Network is is a key organisation and and helps to bring other organisations together. But we we also do, uh, have, you know, the occasional chat with one or two other people as well. And, and, it's, and what I think is, is fantastic is that there is this, and network is such a good word, isn't it? A network that brings together these organizations 
um, so, so that we can make sure that we're all at least moving broadly in the same direction. But, you know, when I think of some of the people I talked to, I was recently talking uh, to the people who sort of coordinate rural shops. I mean, when you think about the effect of the pandemic that there has been in urban areas, on city center shops, that's one thing. When you think what a rural shop can contribute during the pandemic, in my own local village here, a very small village, we, we've got a single shop and it's been doing fantastic work. It's been closed, but it's been delivering food. It's had volunteers going in to help them put together uh, for elderly people in the area and so on. Uh, but it's done much more than that. It's kept people in touch who've been self-isolating so that they at least have somebody who's at least knocking on a door and at a distance shouting to them and so on. You know, I, I, I've been doing things like running um, a, a quiz, a weekly quiz for uh, families in the village. You know, I mean, there's so much has been going on uh, in rural areas and, and demonstrating what we really can do. And that's why at the beginning I said, governments have totally underestimated the contribution that rural areas can make to the country at large. And it is ridiculous when you think that, for instance, on the whole, rural businesses are more likely to make a profit, they're better exporters, and yet overall, rural areas contribute below our fair share, if you like, a contribution to national GDP. And that's not the fault of people in rural areas, it's the fault of governments that have successively failed to understand and therefore provide the right resources and backup uh, that we need to deliver what we're capable of delivering. Don, I was going to invite you to say a few words at the end, just to wrap up, but you may well have already done that in that last, last statement. Well, so yeah, it did encapsulate I mean, all the things that we both believe in. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, when you think about revitalising uh, rural, I mean, that's really absolutely fundamental. And I'm absolutely delighted that your conference is focusing on that. We can use all sorts of different language. In our report, we said uh, that we wanted to have a rural strategy. We argued that the government thinks it's a great idea to have an industrial strategy. And to be fair, it's a pretty good strategy. And amazingly, it's one of the few things government did where they actually did rural proof it. And they did it rather well. So I'm prepared to give them huge credit for doing that. And always saying, and I think this is what you're saying, certainly what my committee and my committee colleagues are saying, is that we need to have a similar thing for the rural economies across the country that revitalizes rural. So we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. We've now got to sing more loudly so that the government really does start to listen. Don Foster, thank you very much indeed for your time uh, and for that wonderful um, exposition of all of these issues uh, that we are grappling with. We will get there, of that I am sure. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Don. No, thank you, and I hope you all have a fantastic conference. Um, and, you know, um, let's just keep fingers crossed that before too long we get over the pandemic and then really start to focus on uh, achieving what we all know we need to do so that we can uh, revitalize rural. Good luck. <laughs>